Welcome in, everybody. It's news and views for an Easter Monday, April the 9th, 2012. Welcome in. Anyway, got a good program lined up for you. As always, a special guest will be with us, uh, Congressman Ron Paul. He was with us last October, and uh, you got a chance to meet him when he was down here with Walter Jones at an event. Mm -hmm. I was out of town that weekend, so I missed out. But uh, here it is, uh, some 11 months after he first announced. And I understand that we have Congressman Ron Paul with us right now. Congressman Paul, welcome back to News and Views. Good to have you with us. Yes. Thank you. Good to be with you. We were just saying, uh, Congressman Paul, it was back on May the 13th that you publicly announced that you would uh, seek the Republican nomination for the presidency of the United States. And, of course, four weeks from tomorrow is the North Carolina primary. And uh, the current delegate count, I'm sure you're well aware of it for our audience, uh, Governor Romney has uh, 656 delegates. Uh, Santorum has 272. Gingrich has 140. And uh, according to uh, Real Clear Politics, you have 67. Now, now, some of those, I know, are not totally uh, uh, final decision on, on them. But uh, here we are about a month away from the Republican uh, primary for North Carolina. And you probably have some voters out there who uh, might still be undecided. You have other voters who maybe were even leaning towards Ron Paul, but says, you know, he's not my first choice, but maybe I should hold my nose and vote for Romney. <laughs> how, would you, how would you go ahead and uh, say, hey, I want you to take another look at Ron Paul. Uh, it, it might be late in the game in some people's estimation, but uh, wh why is Ron Paul still a, a viable candidate and, and worthy of consideration? This idea has been around for a long time in politics. You vote for the lesser of two evils because the media tells, uh, tells us that uh, either or will be elected. But I think that's really wasting votes if two people are, are essentially the same. Uh, I think this has occurred many, many years, you know, even at the presidential elections when, when the nominees are known. Uh, they're, oh, well, one of them's going to win. So if, if they're close to being the same and you vote for one of them, I think those are wasted votes. Mm -hmm. People who support me feel like that uh, they're not wasting their vote. It's worthwhile. Their goal is to win, and you can't uh, win without the vote. So it's um, it's a struggle to change perceptions, but... It is traditional, at least in this campaign, to hear so many people say, yeah, I sure like Ron Paul. He says the right things. But uh, we're told he can't win, so we'll have to go someplace else. You know, we were just at a story. Uh, you were in the news about a week ago uh, when the election reports came out, and we made mention of the fact that, that your campaign – listed a number of things that the other campaigns uh, didn't list. You were just being above board in terms of your honesty. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had uh, toll booth funds and you know, donuts. donuts and Twinkies. <laughs> and and I, I, I said on the air, Congressman Paul, I said, you know, everybody keeps saying they want an honest guy in the White House. Here he is. Why don't you vote for him? Yeah, you know, most of my opponents are always – Pretty nice in a way, condescending, but they'll say, you know, the one thing is, Ron, we do grant you, you are, you are very consistent, which means to me, it's funny, they say this in an open fashion. I said, well, I guess they're not consistent. <laughs> and, uh, it's almost like they did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, uh, they frequently will, will say that. And uh, if they're looking for, you know, somebody that will do what they say, uh, the young people seem to get excited about that because they'll, they'll hear my speeches, you know, over the last several years. And they said, well, this can't be true, but I'll go look at his voting record anyway. And then they'll come back to me and they said, that's when I was really impressed because you actually voted that way. Right, right. Mm -hmm. We're talking to Congressman and presidential candidate Ron Paul. Our uh, North Carolina primary is four weeks from tomorrow. Congressman Paul, you have consistently had a following that uh, gives you somewhere between 8 and 12 percent of the vote in most of these states. Uh, in fact, the latest High Point University poll for North Carolina actually has you with 15 percent of the vote in North Carolina. And uh, with that slice of the pie and giving, given the fact that Ron Paul and libertarian philosophy followers are so enthusiastic over your candidacy and recognizing that whoever wins this nomination, if they're going to beat Obama in the fall, they really need to have that Ron Paul voter passionate enthusiasm. And I've heard many people say that whoever wins the nomination, if it's not Ron Paul, whoever wins the nomination, 
they would really be smart to make sure that Ron Paul has a place at the table. Now, I know right now you're still looking at the nomination, but when you hear that, what do you, what does a place at the table look like to you? I mean, I've heard anything from, well, you know, we'll let him give a speech at the convention. I'm thinking, well, that's sort of like kissing your sister. And I've also heard all the way up to, hey, let's consider Ron Paul for the uh, Treasury, uh, Secretary of Treasury. What, is, what does a place at the table look like to you? I, I have no idea because I don't think a whole lot about it. Nobody else has mentioned to me, and what they think is a place at the table in a conventional way wouldn't possibly give me much interest. But the more pertinent thing is is that 12 to 15 percent is really the toughest place to get the votes, and they're talking about the Republican primary. Right. Because most of the people coming out to our rallies – uh, aren't typical Republicans. They've either never been voted, you know, voted before, or they're very independent, or they're Democrats. And they don't necessarily like to go to the Republican primary. So when you're talking about will we have an influence, are these views endorsed by a significant amount of number of people? It's a lot more than 15%. And that's what you're saying is even more pertinent. So instead of dealing with uh, 10 or 12% that they have to deal with, they're, they're probably dealing with more with 25 to 30. Mm-hmm. Now, you've got uh, some primaries coming up uh, the 24th of this month and then a bunch more uh, primaries when we have ours on uh, May the 8th. What are, what are things looking like for you uh, in these upcoming states? Well, it's hard to say uh, because we always do better in the caucus states. We have a lot of votes yet to count in the caucus states that we've already been because it takes months, you know, for that process to, uh, you, you know, unwind and find out who really becomes the delegates. But uh, we're we're still plotting along, and uh, and and there's several. I mean, I mean, right right now we're spending some time in, in California. Because if you win a district, you get some votes, and Texas is the same way, so we're going to be working hard in Texas right now. Those are the two states that we're working the hardest in. Well, but we're going to get up into, into, uh, into Pennsylvania and New York, and uh, as well as uh, Delaware and Rhode Island. Will uh, we see Ron Paul in North Carolina? I don't know if we have uh, any more schedule there, mainly because it's, you know, it's, it's uh, the way I understand, I think it's a winner-take-all state, mm-hmm. which makes it more difficult for mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. You know, you have done, uh, Congressman Paul, a, a great job over your entire political career, but especially having the national spotlight within these last, uh, this last year or so of really re-educating the people on our Constitution, that uh, we need to hold to that document, not to public popularity or opinion, but we need to hold to the Constitution as the final arbiter of what is or is not proper law in our country. Uh, given that fact, um, and, and, now, and also considering the fact that Congress has long crossed across the line of Article One, Section 8, I mean, we've passed that a long time ago, <laughs> Right. But but nevertheless, are you pleased with the inroads that you have made in re-educating the populace on the Constitution? Oh, ab- absolutely. I think that's uh, where uh, we have achieved a whole lot, probably more than I ever dreamed. Um, but, you, you know, the, the, the difficulty, though, is translating that into actual votes in Washington. I think... I think um, Washington and the politicians there in the Congress are very, very slow to react to what's happening. I don't think they realize, for instance, uh, what how the people in this country now really feel about Afghanistan and these other wars. I mean, they're tired of them. They want to come home, and the military's tired of them. And they give me their support, and yet the Congress just marches on. And just look how the other Republican candidates, uh, instead of taking a little more modest tone, uh, they're trying to even be more militant than the president, and yet the people are unhappy with the president not doing what he implied that he he would do. So mm-hmm. it's a, it's a shame, but there's uh, we, we always want things to move uh, faster. But uh, I'm very encouraged, of course, with the enthusiasm of the young people because they're just moving in, and there's been articles out to show how many young people now are being very active and they're getting elected to different positions and they're running for state offices. So. If it's a true revolution, as we talk about um, the, the, this, uh, the, the people who believe this way, they're not just going to fade away and disappear. I think it's just really the beginning. 
Well, that was going to be my point. It seems like the libertarian message is just seeming a little slow to take off. You have a very fervent following, but it just seems to be much smaller than your typical establishment. What do you see um, that we can do or you can do to get your message out there to a broader appeal? Because if you ask people individually, they agree with the libertarian message. But in the general population, it seems like it's just not catching fire the way you would think it would. Yeah, if you look at it one way, but um, and, I, and I look for the more positive things that, you know, I would go around the country 30 years ago and to a college campus and I'd get 30 people. Mm. <laughs> so right. You can see why it's different. Even five years ago, it wasn't quite like this. And here, people claiming the election is over, quit, everybody quit. Romney is the nominee. Well, our, our, uh, our rallies are getting bigger. Mm. You know, and more enthusiastic. The real problem is, and I think maybe this is what you, you might be witnessing, is that uh, we're not getting the coverage maybe that yeah. we, we deserve. And it sounds like we don't have very many people. But, but what what if they had taken, you know, when we get 7,000 people, what if uh, somebody in the media had come and taken pictures of people who maybe waited in line for two hours and climb up on trees <laughs> and, and fill auditoriums. Yeah. I mean, that's how enthusiastic they are mm-hmm. about this message and how disgusted they are. But the coverage is is not there. But in spite of the lack of coverage, I think it's amazing how much enthusiasm is. I give a lot of credit for talk shows, and I give a lot of credit to the Internet, and it's all in spite of the evening news on the on the major networks. So do you think that the Libertarian Party, if it continues to go as it has over the last 10 or 20 years, uh, 10 or 20 years from now, do you think it's going to be a viable, competitive third party that would uh, compete victoriously against the Democratic and Republican Party? Well, that's, that's a big question, um, because you'd think if these views... Uh, which are very liberal, that I have a very libertarian, that it would give a real boost to the party. Uh, I think the ideas are going to keep growing by leaps and bounds, and, and what we've seen in the last five years have been dr- very dramatic. But the problem I see with, with the third party movements is that the laws are so biased against us. You know, I tried it at one time, and you can't get on ballots, you don't get in debates. I guess who controls the debates in the fall? The Republicans, a commission made up of Republican and the Democrats. So if you get uh, a good candidate in an alternative party, you know, you're you're not going to be in the debate. I I get rather disgusted about the amount of money and the lives lost by us pretending that we can force on other countries, you know, our democratic way of life and teach them how to elect have elections. We go over there and do that. We have they have elections. We don't like them, so we ignore the elections. At the same time, the democratic process here uh, is, is seriously flawed, and mm. uh, all you have to do is ask some of our supporters how they get pushed around at some of these primary elections in the various states. They get they get pretty disgusted about you, you know uh, how, how how difficult it is to get a fair shake. Is that one of your motivations in hanging in the race? And I and I'm not taking away from the fact that you've got your eye on the prize, but I mean, is is furthering the libertarian cause and legitimizing in in the media? Uh, all those things that you've mentioned, is that is that one of the motivations of hanging in there uh, through the convention? Well, it's always been my motivation from the very first time I ran because I never expected to be in office. And so I've always surprised how well the message has been received. So that's always been uh, the reason. And a lot of times people ask me that question and they say, well, you're like I'm being deceitful that – Oh, you're not caring about winning. You're just doing this. You know, send out a message. So, for one, you admit you don't you don't want to win or you don't expect to win, uh, and it's all about your message. Well, why can't you do both? Why can't you run seriously and mm-hmm. see how well you can do? And and if if elections can be won, and there was a lot of stumbling in this campaign. Uh, oh yeah, uh, you know, there were about nine or ten in in this race and. Uh, I'm essentially in third place right now. So if you look on the positive side of that, you know, it's it's not all that bad. But so, yes, you're right. It is. The message is very, very important to me. But winning is very important. But it's only on those terms that I have designed for myself. And that is, you know, defending the Constitution, limited government, personal liberty and all the things I talk about. Yeah, we're talking with uh, Congressman Ron Paul, who is uh, vying for the Republican nomination for the Republican president of the United States. 
Uh, yeah, and you know, in, in all honesty, uh, Congressman Paul, that might be a bigger legacy than winning the presidency, is getting, getting our country back to the Constitution. I know that it sounds like that's second tier, but in all honesty, if you can start a, a movement back to embracing the Constitution, you know, a hundred years from now, you, you might be up there on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I doubt that, but my my personal inward goals has always been not to seek power but also, but uh, but to have some influence on the direction of the country. So that subtly is something that uh, I, I think is is very very important. So uh, the others run, you know, for the prestige and the power. I think Republicans and Democrats, they're all they're arguing over is power. Mm. I mean, the foreign policy isn't going to change, or entitlements that that won't change, or the Fed's not going to change. So I, I think the. The other, the other goal of actually having influence without seeking power, I think it's a worthy goal as well. Do you see uh, your son Rand, the junior senator from Kentucky, do you see him picking up the torch for you and you passing the baton onto him? Will he carry on your same message? Well, I'm, I'm sure he will. I don't see it as... Uh, you know, that I do something and one day I quit and he does something else. I mean, he's very much involved and he's, uh, you know, making a name for himself. Uh, so I'm sure he will continue. And our views are, they're, I don't think the views of two people are ever absolute. So, so we all have, you know, some disagreements. But, no, he's going to continue to do that. But there's going to be a lot of others. I mean, even though we don't see it being reflected in the Congress there are new members of Congress, you know, that are that are certainly coming our way. And I think in time there's going to be a lot more. If the Libertarian Party were to take off, who do you think it would uh, cause more harm to, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? Well, uh, if, if, uh, if it is true that the party stands for, you know, personal liberty, I think it appeals to left and right equally. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people make the assumption that they say, you know, they say, are you going to run a third party? And the assumption is, if I did that, it would only hurt the Republicans. I, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, if, 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 uh, if one talks to the people at rallies, we get a lot from the left, uh, and uh, so it, it's hard to say. Um, but, but I, I would hope, and I think it should cut across the board because right now. Think of how many people are sick and tired of Obama with his, uh, you know, promotion of wars and and his attack on civil liberties. Uh, so, if if you had a viable alternate candidate that had enough money to get this message out, I don't think there's any doubt that the votes would come from both sides. Hmm. As you look down the road and uh, what what comes up next, if if you don't go to the White House, you decided not to run for re-election for your congressional seat. Will you continue to to be involved in politics down the road? Yeah, I you know I know I've announced I won't be running for Congress, and uh, I'd, I'd have a hard time not thinking about this. You know, when I first ran back in the seventies, it was my concern about uh, the monetary policy that I believe that would lead to this type of financial uh, debt problem that we have. Um, so that's I've invested a lot of time and money and energy into this. So whether I was in office or out of office. Uh, I was uh, always interested in that. I, I, w- I would have a lot of trouble not uh, talking about it. And if uh, somebody still wants to hear from me, I'll be around. You know, I, and I know you uh, co- constantly talk about the fact that Congress has long passed Article 1, Section 8, which outlines the uh, what the Congress is allowed to do. And and we have ignored the Constitution, but is it any surprise to you really that uh, President Obama not only pushes through Obamacare, but then when the Supreme Court um, looks like they're going to vote it down, that he actually tries to intimidate the Supreme Court? You know what? I'm I'm not as shocked as some others are. I mean, I'm disgusted with it, but I think this is routine, and I consider it minor compared to some of the other things he done. But even as far back as FDR, you know, FDR didn't like the court, so he was going to pack the court. Right. So mm-hmm. It's been around a long time. But what about, uh, I'm more annoyed by Obama ignoring, uh, y- you know, the uh, and interfering with the court system by inventing his own courts, you know, and having secret tribunals and ignoring the rule of law. But what about executive orders that write law? Oh, yeah. He, he does that as other and presidents do it. 
Yeah. So, so yeah, the, I think presidents and Obama has been horrible at overstepping the bounds of the judicial system already, even in a more concrete way than him, uh, you know, making some noise and criticizing the court right now. And of course, he, he, as other presidents, have been very intrusive on the legislative branch as well. And you take that a step further, because in all honesty, if Obama is true to form, even if the Supreme Court says you cannot do this, uh, Obamacare is unconstitutional, what's going to stop them from doing it anyway? Because that, I mean, they, they hadn't followed the Constitution up to now. What, what yeah. difference is the Supreme Court going to make? That's that's why respect for the rule of law is, is so important. You know, a month or two ago, uh, he was trying to get the Congress to pass some environmental law, and he, he was so so arrogant. He says, well, you're taking too long. I'll just write an executive order. <laughs> that's, exactly. That's I mean, in the old days, they might have impeached the president for being so right. arrogant, you know, right. or something like that. Well, it's always a crisis for him, so that's how he gets his way. Yeah. Can we switch gears and talk policy for a minute? I'm a teacher. That's my day job. So I wanted to ask you a question about the Department of Education. You've said you wanted to get rid of that. So how would that benefit the country if we did that? You know, we might save a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> that might be yeah. one thing. <laughs> And by the way, I agree uh, with you on it. I, I think we should do. I teach in private yeah. schools, but uh, see, I don't. I don't see how a Department of Education, the Central Economic Planning, it takes a lot of bureaucrats, uses a lot of money, and then it has universal uh, uh, desires to ha- design all the educational programs. Uh, it's unconstitutional in, in one sense. There's no authority to run the educational system. So I think uh, schools should be run locally. I think um, if a, sco- a local school district does something wrong and it's a poor di- district, it hurts, it hurts that district. But when a national organization or maybe a national educational union, <laughs> you know, uh, pushes programs, it hurts everybody. No Child Left Behind isn't popular with a whole lot of people, mm-hmm. you know, left or right, uh, teachers or the administration. And uh, it, it just shouldn't be. You know, we, we shouldn't have it that way. And I think, I think politically it's dangerous because uh, when, when they can dictate curriculums, uh, this can lead to nothing but mischief. Mm-hmm. Congressman Paul, some people have caught you an isolationist and others say, well, no, he's a non-interventionist. Which one is it and uh, what's the difference? Well, I see the isolationist term is um, used just as a pejorative to make somebody look bad. Right. Uh, but those who say that what I believe is isolationists uh, are completely wrong because they're more isolationist than I would be because they want to put a sanctions on countries. They want to, you know, close trade down as they do, you know, with countries like Iran. They do not want open trade like I do with uh, Cuba because I'm convinced the founders were right. The more you trade and talk to people, the less likely you are to have wars with people. So they're very much isolations. I want to trade with people and travel back and forth and exchange ideas, practice more diplomacy. The only thing I don't want to do is I don't want to be an interventionist in the internal affairs of other nations, and I don't believe we have the moral or constitutional right nor the money to put our troops around the world. And We're in um, about a hundred and... Uh, 50 countries and have over 900 bases. Uh, we can't afford it anymore, and it, it's caused a lot of enemy, brought a, a lot of enemies uh, to us. Uh, we've had more enemies for this. So um, they just use that word uh, isolationism to try to discredit. The neocons do that in particular because they're much more aggressive in wanting to run the American empire, and, and they, it's almost like a religion for them to uh, spread America's power and goodness around the world, even mm-hmm. if we have to kill people. To make them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm yeah, prove, tag- prove our goodness, huh? Yeah, how good we are. <laughs> I'm going to tag on to that a little bit, because the two things that you've been criticized most for are your foreign policy and your war on drugs. And so I'm going to ask you a question about the drugs, and many people would agree with you about the war on drugs, which is often considered a huge waste of money. One of the most debilitating and lethal drugs is the homemade meth, which can be made almost anywhere. Can you explain how this issue would be dealt with if agencies stopped enforcing the traffic on this particular drug? Well, you, you know, when they make something illegal, uh, people go ar- around it. And uh, a lot of times they'll make a drug that doesn't qualify for restrictions, or it'll be just, it becomes more concentrated and more dangerous. They did this during Prohibition. 
the alcohol they made was more likely to be contaminated, and it was always stronger. It didn't weaken. It wasn't weaker in, in, in content percentages. So when you have a free market and it's out in the open, uh, you might have, say, beer that's 2%, 3%, or 4%. So there's a lot of disadvantages. People died from the alcohol in the, um, in, during the uh, Prohibition era. And this is what happens when drugs are illegal. And to me, it's a freedom issue. I just think people have the right and the responsibility to take care of themselves. And if they think marijuana might help them, they ought to be able uh, to, to, to do that. But it, the federal government would be out of it completely. States would still have some rights to do it. Uh, there's no, nothing in the Constitution right. that says the, uh, the, the, the states uh, have to do what the federal government tells them. So it would be like alcohol. There's, there's restrictions. Uh, kids have a harder time getting alcohol today than they get, have getting marijuana, and it's illegal. Mm-hmm. So the states, the states would make up their own minds on most of this. Right, and I remind people often when they say, well, he's for legalized drugs, and I say, well, he, he's saying the federal government ought not to be involved. You have no problem or qualms with having the state government get involved and saying, no, we're going to, we are going to regulate that on a state level. Yes. And I think they would be wiser. And we have a, there's a pretty good example of what to look at. And that was, uh, you know, prior, prior to say 1938 or even prior to 1912, like the 12 Harrison Act. I mean, everything was legal, <laughs> you know, and people weren't all addicts. And, you know, one time this came up in a debate and they said, yeah, you'd even legalize heroin or something like that. So I was sort of disgusted with the whole thing. So I asked the audience, now, if we made heroin illegal, made heroin legal, how many of you would smoke heroin? You right, know? right. The whole thing is, is nobody's going to, I mean, uh, the people who, who are going to abuse themselves and they're having a problem, uh, the law won't pre- prevent them from, uh, from, from doing it. I, from both politically and medically, I, I just think drug addiction is a serious problem. But it's more in the disease category than in a crime category. Mm-hmm. So if you drink alcohol and you hurt somebody in your automobile, you ought to be punished. But uh, as an alcoholic, we don't put them in prison. But here we put people who have not committed violent acts, committed, been caught three times, and could get sentenced for life. You know, mm-hmm. rapists and murderers sometimes don't get those kind of sentences. Right. So the whole war on drugs is absolutely insane. It's costly. doesn't do any good. It's been much more harmful than anything else. But, you know, I've come to the conclusion that there, there has to be more special interests that don't want this. I think alco- uh, the people who make alcohol want the war on drugs to continue because maybe they'd get a little bit of help from or satisfaction from marijuana. I think the drug companies might sell uh, less uh, pain medication if uh, drugs were legalized. So there's, um, I, think the, hmm. I think the drug dealers certainly don't want them to be getting legalized. And I think uh, well-intended but uh, misdirected, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christian people think that, well, we're going to make everybody a good person, so therefore we have to make them illegal. So I think that group of people get together, and they perpetuate the war. So I think the logic it never, it has never hurt me in my district, and I've had this position for, you know, 30, 40 years. And they always reelected me. So I think the people themselves subtly know that this war on drugs hasn't accomplished a whole lot. Right. Mm-hmm. Congressman, we have kept you a lot longer than we had planned, and we do appreciate your mm-hmm. uh, patience. Let me just ask in closing, are you having a good time? You look like you are. Yeah, I am, but I, I think if I didn't meet a lot of young people who give me encouragement and will be uh, very active, uh, I wouldn't be as encouraged as I am. So uh, campaigning helps me a whole lot. I, I imagine it's uh, a little on the tiring side. Yeah, it is. If I'm gone, uh, you know, six or seven days uh, from my house, or if I don't get my exercise in, then I get a little grouchy. <laughs> well, you've been, you must have had a good weekend because you've been very kind yes, to us. Yes, thank you so much. All right. What, good but, to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Thank you, Congressman Paul. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Congressman Ron Paul, presidential candidate for the Republican nomination. And uh, although it sounds like things are winding down a little bit for him, he's still uh, up. And excited. Yeah, but kind of sad that he's been beat up so much. You know, he's 76 years old. Come on, give him a break, people. <laughs> Eastern Carolina media, News especially. and Views.